Um, yeah, today we're having a call with Steve Justin, and he's going to talk about shuffle out of the slightest pulse and indigent skills. Thank you for all for coming. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. And yeah, let me try to share my screen. I finally learned how to use an iPad after many years of resisting. So hopefully I can get this to work. All right, there we go. Uh, so this, yes, yeah, so this is a joint work with uh, Sasha Garbali. The paper is the, in the art on the archive. And uh, I did give a similar talk for, I, I don't think many of you were in the audi audience in, um, well, so to speak, in the virtual audience. So I'll try to, but anyway, I'll try to present things a little bit differently than the, and my previous talk on the subject. So yeah, I just want to go straight into you know what what is the the lattice path story, which is probably the one that's most relevant to quantum integrable systems. And so this is a very simple model, which you've uh, I'm sure encountered before. So start with a square lattice, a square grid of size n, and you have path um, entering from uh, the. Okay, so sorry, I'm, yeah. So this is a typical example. You have path entering from the left, um, exiting at the top, and you're asked for the following condition that the, so that the paths have different colors or labels or whatever, and you're asked for the, the top path to exit at the left, the second to the second slot. So basically the, the, ordering, the ordering of the colors is the, uh, the same uh, at the top and at the left. And so this is the example in size three, and these are all the lattice paths that satisfy these constraints. So they they can do they can do whatever they want. They can cross, for example, you have an example here of path crossing. Uh, so they're not in, they're not non intersecting lattice path. They're arbitrary lattice path, and the only thing they can't do is share an, an edge, but they can share vertices. And yeah, that's about it. And and then you you assign to that uh, Boltzmann weights. So. Hmm. Let me tr try to draw really quickly the different uh, weights. So I guess there's going to be a bunch of them. Um, it's going to be so uh, since I need several colors, I'll do it in steps. There we go. And uh, I guess I'll need another color, so green. Um, so this one, uh, this one, and this one, this one, and that's about it. And I guess I'll need to go back to black for, and there's also a completely empty vertex, I guess. And all the, the dots means just empty. So these are all the possibilities of what can happen. And you assign to them Boltzmann weights. Um, so this one will have weight one minus T. Oh, these, actually these, yeah, no, this one will have weight one minus T. This one will have weight Q inverse one minus T. This one has weight T one minus Q inverse. And this has weight one minus Q inverse. And this one has weight one minus T Q inverse. This is just a parameterization of the integrable uh, weights for this model. So I guess some of you might want to call this a colored six vertex model or whatever. Though there are not, there are not six vertices and colors are really a matter of taste. But anyway, it's, it's the, if you like, UQ A uh, N hat. Um, model in its fundamental representation. So really nothing, uh, this is a very classical model that has been studied many times. People have written hundreds of pages, long papers about this, but my claim is that I can actually compute this uh, partition function exactly. There's actually a simple formula for it. So that's the main kind of, in fact, that was the original goal of the paper we wrote, but then it turns out to be a surprisingly long story to actually compute this uh, explicitly, to compute the partition function of this thing. Um, just to give you an idea, um, the, the answer in the trigonometric uh, case is a little bit complicated to write, though it's still very completely explicit. But so let me give you the, the answer, at least in the rational limit, which is simpler. Um, the rational limit, that means you take uh, t goes to one and t, t q both go to one, but they, they scale as so something like t equals, or let's say exponential. So with my notation, something like that. So uh, q equals exponential minus alpha, and you, uh, sorry, h bar alpha. And you send h bar to zero, let's say. So you send t and q to one in a correlated manner in such a way that you know you can expand all these one minus t uh, at first order. And then the answer is particularly simple. Uh, the partition function is just uh, one over n factorial um, product. So, so it's going to be a coefficient in some 
uh, polynomial. Uh, sorry, no. Uh, it's going to be so you, you write the this, the following um, multivariate polynomial. Um, and I intentionally introduced this beta and alpha to make the expression look a little bit more symmetric. Oh, I'm running out of space. Oops. The third term here, uh, alpha plus beta uh, plus ui minus uj. And finally, you take, so, so this, is a, this is a polynomial, but you only take the, the coefficient of uh, ui to the power n minus one, i one to n. So you take one coefficient inside uh, this uh, polynomial, um, and then um, I'm realizing I can't see any of you guys. So wait, I see, I see. Okay, never mind. Uh, um, okay, I'll just continue. Um, right. So this is it. This is the exact answer. Um, the nice thing is uh, the, the important thing to notice is this structure here, very specifically um, uh, this part here. Uh, this is very characteristic of uh, shuffle algebras. Um, the shuffle algebra um, are related to um, toroidal algebras, basically. So the fact that there are three terms, sorry, three factors here, one, two, three is characteristic of a uh, sort of the shuffle algebras associated to uh, toroidal algebras. And it's a bit puzzling why this would occur in a model which is really just based on our good old quantum groups, which we used to, so non toroidal stuff. So there's a bit of mystery here, and it is indeed a long, as I said, long route to um, go from this partition function to this expression, or to its generalization to the trigonometric regime, and that's the object of the paper we wrote with uh, Sasha. And um, I should also point out that there is an interpretation in terms of algebraic geometry, which is actually was my original motivation for computing this partition function um, in general. Uh, this z in general is related to the Hilbert series of um, well, is, is there symmetrization? No Over symmetrization. No. no. Sorry, who, I can't see who is asking but, questions, so I don't know. So, so use are the spectral parameters because you did not uh, put them in the way. Oh, Sasha is asking me a question. Now that, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> you should know this is expression is in our paper. No, there's but no symmetrization. I'm, say, I'm saying that you did not put the use in the way it's that you described these are both. just formal variables. Correct. Okay. These are not spectral parameters. These are just formal variables, and I just take one coefficient in the um, in this polynomial. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's an interpretation of this as being the Hilbert series on multigraded like Hilbert series of the commuting scheme. And in particular, uh, the expression in the rational limit, that's nothing but um, so, it's, so this is the trigonometric case. So in, in the rational case, uh, this is nothing but the degree of the commuting scheme, which is something which I studied many years ago with uh, first with Philip DiFrancesco and then with uh, Alan Knudsen. And so this is a completely new expression. So this expression but in, in itself is not that useful, but the, simply the fact that it's related to lattice path is, is a big surprise a priori. And um, there's a long story, which I'm not gonna talk about today on, on how I actually got to that connection between lattice path and, uh, and the commuting scheme. This is my work with uh, Alan Knudsen, which is still unpublished, but uh, at the end of the day, yeah, that there, is, there, there is a connection, but to be honest, it's not like, even if you, if you knew all the algebraic geometry, it wouldn't necessarily help you uh, find this expression because uh, in the paper, there is actually a proof, so to speak, of this formula using purely, you know, algebraic geometric arguments using, you know, like push forwards of certain um, cleverly chosen uh, line bundles and some um, quasi projective schemes, which somehow, you know, are related to the committing schemes. But, but the truth is you would never guess that these geometric constructions uh, without uh, having derived independently this expression. So as often in, in my work, I find that, you know, at the end of the day, you can rederive everything geometrically, but you would never guess the formulas. So purely geometrically, because there, there would be some very non-trivial choice of line bundles, which, you know, there's some very, very curious vanishing of, of higher sheaf cohomology, which you would never guess a priori, at least I would never guess it. And apparently nobody else had guessed it because the expression is new. So, so anyway, so now we're going to switch gears and I'm going to explain how uh, I got to that result. And um, 
Okay, so uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about truffle algebras. We're going to have three different algebras, and we're going to uh, show that they're all isomorphic. And I'm going to talk about the isomorphism between these uh, three algebras. Okay, so um, so yeah, this is when I get back to more or less what the paper is about. Um, so the 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 um, first algebra is the center of the Heck algebra. Center of Hecke. Um, and so, uh, oops. So I need a few definitions. Oh, no, actually, sorry. The first one is this. No, maybe I should start with the easier one. Sorry, mistake, mistake, cancel. Um, okay, so there are three uh, algebras I want to talk about. The first one is the algebra of symmetric functions. So uh, in all that follows, I'm always uh, using uh, this as the base uh, field. Um, and so, yeah, I want to talk about first symmetric functions. Um, so let me denote it lambda. And so lambda is just, um, uh, you can think of it as just a polynomial in an infinite number of like, countable number of variables. Uh, it's graded. Uh, these, you, you can think of them as the power sums. And uh, that's pretty much all I want to say about it at this stage. Um, that you can take the definition of the, well, ring or algebra of symmetric functions. Um, then there is the uh, center of Hecke. Um, so again, I'm taking an algebra, which I denote Hn over this field F. So um, in Hecker, there is actually no role played by um, the variable Q. For, an, for, 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 for now, it's just uh, an extra variable that I allow myself to use. But the definition of Hecker only involves the, the parameter T. And so N is some, yeah, some integer. Uh, and yeah, so it's the usual definition. You have generators. Um, and then you have uh, relations, uh, ti, t, so you have the grade relations. Um, yeah, this one, so that's where the parameter t occurs, uh, ti plus t, and then you have uh, ti for i minus j, i minus j, greater than one. All right, and um, the important thing is this is also, um, there is a, uh, there's a sort of shuffle product there. So in other words, of course, this is an algebra, so it has a product, but that's not what I want to talk about. I want to define another product, um, which is this shuffle product, which goes from HK tensor HL to HK plus L, and which takes an element here. Let me write it just X tensor Y or, I mean, I just define, yeah, it doesn't matter if it's, a, if, if it's actually a pure tensor product, the definition doesn't care about that, but uh, let me just write it this way for clarity. Um, and okay, this is the part where I try to write, yes, let me write it correctly as S K L of T minus W, a T W X T W inverse. And I have to explain what the notation means. So W here, uh, okay, so first, what is SKL? SKL is the um, set of shorters. So it's a set of representatives of, of a coset of shorter representatives uh, in uh, SK plus L. So the symmetric group divided by this thing. So it's just a um, certain permutation. So it's basically just Grassmannian permutations, if you like, Grassmannian permutations. Um, Could there be so a Y in there? Say it again. Should there be a Y in there? I see right, X right. on the right hand side. I don't. Yeah. See. Okay. Fine. So I, I keep making. Okay. Let me just write it X there. Simplify. All right. It's X is X tensor Y, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. So okay. keep going back and forth between these two. Yeah. Anyway. Um. But yes. Thank you. And um, this is the length of the permutation. So, uh, so that means, um. If you write W because a product of elementary transpositions, 
SI1 dot 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 SIL, then L is just W, oh, bad name, L is already used. Um, well, actually, let me just write literally like this. Uh, this is a reduced decomposition. And um, and TW is just uh, TSI1 dot 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 TSIW. Right. Um, and um, and the key lemma, which is not very complicated, but if you've never thought about it, it might seem a little bit non-trivial, is that if X and Y are central, so let's say, so I use the letter Z for the center. Um, so this is center. Uh, and uh, Y in Z of um, HL. Uh, oh, so I haven't given a name to this thing. Let me uh, call it uh, X. Ah, right, so that's the problem, of course. Yeah, if I... <laughs> If I don't say X tensor Y, then I can't call that X times one. Okay, so let me denote this thing as star. Okay. Um, then my X implies uh, X uh, star Y is in uh, Z of uh, HK plus L. So um, this gives you a, um, so now you can take the direct sum and that gives you a, um, um, and the graded algebra. So the grading being just N. Uh, and for us, for our purposes, it's always, yeah, F algebra, whatever. Um, so, uh, what's not completely trivial is that it's actually a commutative algebra. And in fact, there is an isomorphism to the uh, previous uh, algebra. So there's actually, um, so Z is actually isomorphic to uh, lambda. And for and, and a, a good correspondence would be uh, to send the power sum. So I, I guess I'll give you the map from lambda to uh, um, z. So let me denote this map psi uh, from lambda to z, uh, and it takes the pk to um, okay up to small factor, uh, which is this t, t number is just the uh, product of um, you see Murphy elements. So the exact ex explicit formulas I'm just writing, but they don't matter too much. Uh, this is actually, this, this, is a, this, is only, this is not my work. This is completely classical. Uh, well, not completely classical. I actually discovered it well. I mean, maybe to the experts, but I certainly didn't know uh, this explicit isomorphism. It's very classical, of course, in the uh, case t equals one, that would be just the, um, um, that would just be the, the Frobenius map, but uh, in the TD form case, uh, okay, well, it's still true. There is an isomorphism between this uh, center, this direct sum of centers and uh, symmetric functions. And yeah, so for example, power sums have a very simple um, 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 All right, so this is the theorem, graded uh, ring isomorphism. Well, there is a question in the chat. Can you lift this algebra to the whole Hecke algebras, not just the centers? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't immediately know the answer to that question. I've already thought about it. Um, maybe somebody else in the audience uh, knows, but I, mm -hmm. I don't know, basically. Not that I know of, basically. Um, now, there are um, um, yeah, there are a few obvious examples of um, elements in the um, in the center. For example, there's something I'll call one, which is the, just the unit of the the um, um, Heck algebra, and so it has a certain pretty much. Um, which is a certain uh, symmetric uh, function. Which I'll denote h tilde n for reasons that I um, don't want to explain yet. Um, there is also another one, which is, um, uh, for example, you can take the sum of all generators, uh, Tw. That's also central. That's the symmetrizer. And of course, you also have skew symmetric versions of these. So there's also an a n, which is an anti symmetrizer, and there's also an another version. So there are two more here, which I'm not, not going to write. 
which are the sort of skew-symmetric versions. But these two are particularly interesting. We'll see that this one is related to, th this ultimately will, will be related to the partition function that I care about, this one. And this one is nothing but the ease again correct in the, the um, partition function. So it's another, it's, a, it's a, sometimes it's a simpler one. So, but, but these two are kind of the two important examples of elements of the center. Oh, okay. And the, I didn't give the uh, corresponding. So psi inverse uh, of SN uh, is just, um, I guess, HN. So this one actually is known explicitly. This is the uh, uh, elementary, uh, sorry, the complete uh, symmetric function. Uh, H tilde n is, is differs from H n by uh, um, by a plastic substitution. But okay, uh, I won't say give the formula yet. Okay, so these are the this is the second algebra, and the third algebra is the uh, shuffle algebra related to um, uh, tor toroidal algebra. Um, so related to um, um, GL one double hat. Um, so that one, um, let me use the notation X plus minus to be just uh, the set of X one, X one inverse dot, dot, dot. So it's variables uh, and their inverses because I want to have, it's basically, I want to define Laurent polynomials. So I'm going to define F, F X plus minus. So this is just the, uh, the, um, ring of Laurent polynomials with coefficients in F in N variables. And then let me define little zero to be uh, the F span of um, X1 I1 dot 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 Xn I N where the, um, so so far I haven't told you anything, but of course I'm gonna put some restrictions on the, um, on the I's and the restrictions kind of come out of nowhere, but this is what works. Uh, K1 to R, uh, this has to be less or equal to R and minus R for all R in the zero, let's say. So there are certain constraints on the degree. So for example, for R equals one, it tells you the degree in each XI has to be less or equal to N minus one. And also for R equals N, it tells you that the total degree in all variables is zero. Hence my little uh, zero here. Okay, so the, it's it's a certain um, space of polynomials, long polynomials with certain degree constraints. And in fact, let me um, immediately restrict to even further. I only care about the, the symmetric ones. So. so SN here acts by permutation of variables, and I'm only considered this so symmetric polynomials. Okay, and finally, the main uh, actor in this story is yet another subspace. It's the subspace of the P in, uh, in this space. So Laurent polynomials with these degree, con symmetric Laurent polynomials uh, in these variables with these constraints. And they also satisfy the, these wheel conditions. So the wheel conditions are saying that P of X, Q, X, T, X, dot, 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 with any other variable, number of variables, um, well, n minus three other variables. And then there's a second condition that says this, I haven't told you what it is, but it's gonna be zero, obviously. Um, Tx dot 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 equals zero. So it satisfies those two conditions. And of course, since it's the symmetric polynomials, that means any three, if any three variables satisfy, uh, have, have these ratios, qt or q inverse t inverse, basically, uh, then the, the polynomial has to, the Laurent polynomial has to vanish. Okay. And, and again, there is a product, there is a shuffle product from AK tensor AL uh, to AK plus L. Uh, okay, this time let me write it P tensor Q. Um, okay, this is star. Uh, that takes, that again, is has a very similar form. It's sum over Grassmannian permutations. Um, and then you take P of X, I guess, W of one, dot, 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 W, uh, K, and then Q of uh, X, W, I guess, of K plus one, dot, 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 X, W. So you split the, the variables into two subsets, basically. And then you have, a, of course, some interaction between them. So uh, let's write it this way. 
um, k plus one j plus l. And then you have this function which has the interaction, so something of this form. And then again, this function is characteristic of a um, toroidal algebra, so that means it has this form of with three factors u minus q inverse x, u minus um, Uh, okay, let's see, qt inverse x minus tx. And then you have this kind of von Demon denominator. Um, yeah, I put a tilde because this is not quite the usual normalization of it. This is a slight modification of the usual one. So, but anyway, and, and of course the story is the same. Now you take the sum and um, and then it's well known that, well, it's not known, it's known that this, so this is now again, this graded algebra, and it's known to be isomorphic again to symmetric functions. So, um, um, so yeah, so there is a so theorem, there is a, uh, so A is isomorphic to uh, lambda once again. And I guess the simplest way, um, um, is to define, in this case, not so much maybe the power sums, but rather the uh, elementary symmetric polynomials. So um, let me call the, the isomorphism Y or Upsilon actually, uh, going from, um, I guess, A to Lambda. Not sure if the other one, okay, we'll see. Um, and uh, yes, so here's the, uh, um, so this is the isomorphism, um, where if I define epsilon n to be the following product from ij equals one to n, i not equal to j of one minus let's say t xi over xj. It's not hard to see that this actually satisfies the um, um, wheel condition, so it lives in a n, and I declare that. Uh, y of epsilon n is en, the elementary symmetric polynomial, elementary symmetric function. Uh, so then the claim is that this is an isomorphism. Okay, again, this is not my work. This is all kind of background, but uh, at this stage, the question is kind of obvious is that now can we define directly, um, okay, so we have this little diagram now, we have z. Uh, I guess I sent it the other way by a side to lambda, uh, but it's anyway, it's an isomorphism. Um, we have, I guess, yeah, so my diagram is a bit uh, yeah, like this. I guess A to lambda. Uh, of course, lambda is lambda, um, but I'm still going to put a little error here because, of course, there are, there are plenty of um, automorphisms. So here, possible automorphism here, but the question is, what is the map here? with possible automorphism here. Uh, is there a natural way to define this map? And so let me call this map F. And so the, 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 the key point is that F can be defined naturally in terms of these petition functions that I showed at the beginning, can be defined in terms of uh, this uh, solvable uh, lattice path model, whatever you want to call it. That I talked about at the beginning. Uh, explicitly, the isomorphism, uh, in, all we care about is just there's a kind of trivial form of, uh, remember, this is nothing but uh, f of uh, p1, p2, etc. So there's an obvious automorphism, which is you can rescale the, the variables. And that's uh, so in this case, the, the one that I will happen to need, don't ask me why, is this one. It's basically some form of plethysm and rescaling, basically. So it's a combination of, so it's uh, this thing has this very nice and simple form, uh, which is nicely symmetric in, and also sends P1 to P1, so I like that. Um, so that's the one that makes this diagram work nicely. Of course, you could choose anything you like, or you could redefine, of course, psi or epsilon to absorb some of these factors, but it would be natural. So I'd rather stick uh, to uh, this version. Um, okay, so what's the construction of F? So th this is the, the kind of the main part of the, paper is the construction of this F. Um, 
And so we're going to go through the, um, well, the good story of the investor equation and all that. Okay, so construction above. There. Um, oops, oops, lost it. So, uh, so F goes from uh, Z to A. So, uh, so you give me a, an element of the center of Hecker, and I'm supposed to give you a certain uh, Laurent polynomial, basically in n variables. Um, well, if, if, yeah. So, how does this work? Okay. So, the first thing, which is not completely obvious, why one should do that, is that we're going to work actually inside um, H to n. Uh, so we need twice as many generators. Uh, um, so that means we're going to have like T1 up to T2 to N minus one. And then as usual, we're going to define the R matrix, R check I of um, U to be, uh, so one minus T plus one minus U T I. Um, again, I equals one to N to N minus one. Um, incidentally, if you if you if you like diagrams, then TI I would describe this way as a overcrossing or undercrossing or whatever. And if you look at this expression for a sec, you realize this is nothing. Unfortunately, there's an ugly sign, so it's minus um, this thing minus you uh, this thing. So obviously, yeah, where I use the convention that TI inverse is just uh, this thing. So it's just a linear combination of TI and TI inverse with a coefficient, which is just this uh, U. Um, yeah, the, the minus sign is uh, unfortunate, but okay, I'll, it's too complicated to rewrite everything with another sign, so I left it this way in the paper. Anyway, um, I'll check on this one, I'll check. Yeah, so it satisfies the Baxter equation, which I'll write really quickly. So here, uh, I should point out, yeah, so um, U and V are just formal parameters. So they, whatever you like, you can you just add them to your alphabet, which already has a T and Q. And we're gonna add a, even more alphabets, uh, more letters into our alphabet in the next uh, uh, definition. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, so now we're gonna define, okay, so Z has already been used, so unfortunately, I guess I use that for also for the petition function. I guess this is a flat Z rather than, huh. Okay, so this is not the same Z as the, uh, yeah, that's annoying, okay. Petition function, uh, F, I guess. Let me use F. Um, so it's gonna be a bunch of, so it's gonna be a product of um, N squared um, of these R check and it will reproduce, it's um, is easier to describe it as a picture. So just glue together pictures, and then it's just literally um, a square grid. But uh, let me draw it this way. So uh, I guess, so let me use the, the convention that, um, so all these lines first are oriented from, okay, so they, I could also have put here on the T's, but okay. Uh, and the important thing is the U on the picture is always considered to be the ratio of um, um, left versus divided by right. So if you, so you, so I'll, I'll assign as usual spectral parameters to lines and the, 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 the argument of the R matrix is always the, the ratio. And finally, so here, um, so here's the X1, X2, this Xn. And finally, that's where the Q is gonna appear. I'm gonna take this to be QX1 and then QXn. Um, so of course, if you wrote it explicitly, it would be like, you know, something like the first one would be like odd check uh, N of X1 over Q XN. Uh, did I get it right? The, uh, yes, the left word divided by the right. So I guess there are parentheses, uh, brackets here. And then there's been a whole bunch of other ones. And then in the end will be like odd check N of, um, um, X and I guess over Q Y Q X one I guess something like that, and so I guess the this one would be uh, this one I guess, 
and then uh, this one would be this one. And there's a bunch more, obviously. All right. Uh, so where does this thing live? F lives in um, H2n. But then it has precisely all these arguments, q plus or minus. And it has, of course, dependence on q because of these uh, spectral parameters and also dependence on t uh, because the Heck algebra has uh, t in it, basically, in, in its uh, defining relations. All right. Um, and so the main, uh, so the, the, the thing that I, yeah, that we kind of accidentally stumbled upon is the following fact that there is actually a, a natural condition. All oh, right. So, um, so, so this is a matrix. So, sorry, I should have said, um, yeah. So, so this is an element of um, the Heck algebra. So it, it, that means in, in practice, it has, it has components. You can expand it onto a, a base of H2, H2n. So it has like two uh, n factorial different components. But the question is, when are these components um, symmetric polynomials? And, and more specifically, when do they satisfy wheel conditions? And it turns out that there is a very natural condition uh, for them to, um, um, to, um, to satisfy all these conditions, basically. Um, and basically, the wheel condition comes essentially for free, but um, well, once you have the symmetry. So the, the, actually, the hard part is to show that they're symmetric. Um, so, so this is the question: you know, when condition on you know linear forms chi uh, from uh, H to n uh, to f such that um, chi of f is a, a symmetric, uh, the symmetric Laurent polynomial. It's definitely a Laurent polynomial just by definition, but why would it be symmetric? And so there's this little proposition that we prove in the paper, which is that chi of f is a, a symmetric polynomial if, not if and only if, because of sort of stupid reasons that there are plenty of, uh, I mean, th these components are not, they are linearly dependent. So um, you, to make this into an if and only if statement, you have to work a little bit harder, but. Uh, let me just say if uh, chi satisfies um, that um, chi is kind of like not quite a trace, but it's uh, chi equals k p a for all a in uh, h to n and b in h to n to answer h n. And and the proof is kind of not very complicated. It's the usual game of uh, you know zipping and unzipping a young baxter equation in various ways. You, you start with this picture. Um, and then you say, well, if it's symmetric, um, um, well, you know, if, if you want to, symmetric means you, you should be able, able to switch to two variables. But switching two variables is like saying, OK, so I'm going to put like x i plus 1 here, x i here. Oh, no, sorry, these are the, the yeah, correct. X, so this is the one where the variables are switched. And similarly here, q x i plus one x i q x i, uh, and I'm going to show. I need to show that this at the end of the day is equal to the original one, which is the one where they're uh, correctly ordered. Um, um, so, sorry, Paul. I'm I'm confused. What's the target chi? What is that black more <laughs> bold f? Oh, uh, this is just the base field. So it's just a linear form. So what do you mean by chi of f is a symmetric polynomial then? Right, so, so remember that f lives in uh, this thing. So if you take the image of chi of f, you effectively get something that lives in, a, oh, oops, this lives in h to n, oh, sorry, no, mistake, mistake. Uh, this lives in f um, of uh, x plus minus, right? So it's a poly, it's the Laurent polynomial with coefficients in, um, uh, in F. Uh, okay. Okay. I think I see. Yeah. Thank you. And, and so, yeah, so the trick is to say, well, actually we can emulate the effect of switching these two variables by introducing an extra uh, crossing here. So we're going to start playing a little game of having an extra crossing here, an extra crossing here. But then if anything happens is that because uh, so then you use the young baxter equation to move it all the way across. Uh, but then if anything happens is if you have such a sort of trace-like condition, you can actually also move crossings from the bottom to the top. 
So you can move them here, for example. Yeah, actually, this is the simplest way to do it. You move it here, and then and then this gets absorbed with this one, basically. Um, uh, it's a, uh, it's the, the proof is a little bit, you know, you have to be a little bit more careful, but that's basically the idea. Um, and and of course here, uh, you'll notice that this is not a fully, you know, for the experts, this is not a fully inhomogeneous you know, uh, partition function. We're specializing kind of these parameters and these parameters to be related by a ratio of Q. And that's the key point is that, yeah, so I should probably have said, this is the, the key point here is that this R matrix is always of the form like, xi over xi plus one, but this is also equal to a check i of qxi over qxi plus one. So we're using in a strong way here, the fact that these uh, parameters here and these parameters here have, have, this, have the same ratio. But of course, you know, th we're completely free to do that, right? And particularly if we, at the end of the day, care about the homogeneous limit where all these are equal, there's nothing wrong with, with you know, specializing them in, in, in this way. And so that's kind of like the main trick here. Okay, and um, so as a, so this is still a little bit too general. Again, there's a, there's a bit of freedom here in, in the choice of chi because of the fact that these components are not linearly independent. So that if you think about it for a little while, you realize that there's actually a very natural choice of chi, which is the following. Uh, you just take the linear form, which uh, is of this form. So C here is an element of um, the center of Hecke. Wait, this is not C, this is a weird symbol. I don't know what this is. Let me try again. Um, and Sn is the one that I already shown before. It's just the sum of... Um, uh, sum of W and Sn of um, Tw. And finally, the bracket is just the uh, sort of natural expectation value. So this is the, the naive trace you have, which is just... Uh, um, the coefficient of one, if you like, in the expansion of um, of a Heiko element into um, so um, and and it's clear that because this is central, this will immediately satisfy the. In fact, you could take you no; know, these two both are central, so that means they will satisfy immediately the conditions above. Um, of course, you could cho choose any central element here as well, but. Again, it would be kind of redundant. You could you could kind of absorb the two into one. So you may as well make one natural choice, and this is the most natural one for reasons that I don't want to go too much into. Um, so if you do all this, the, the key point is that oh, okay. So this is the kind of um, end of the story. F now is defined pretty much this way. F now is the map that takes C to chi of. Let's put it chi C. Let's say chi C of F. So that's the map I want to define from uh, the, the center. Uh, Hn to An. And so what I haven't shown you, of course, is that, um, so I've, I've shown you that this thing lives, at, is at least a symmetric polynomial, but I have not shown you that it satisfies the wheel condition, but that's actually very elementary. And um, I mean, the proof is in the paper, but it's actually very uh, simple. So, so that's the claim. Um, so yeah, okay, so let me write the end of it. So, so this is... Okay. This, Quick question: This uh, angle bracket you have on Heck algebra, I should think of it like a co-unit. So sorry, let me just write it first. So F is a graded uh, uh, algebra isomorphism. So that's the main theorem of the paper. Um, well, okay. So this is the Heck algebra. So Heck algebra, the Heck algebra doesn't really have, you know, like it doesn't have like a co-product or um, co-unit per se, so I'm not quite sure um, what you mean, but um, yeah, no, I don't know, actually, not sure. Okay, never mind then, thank you. Mm -mm. Right, so that's the that's kind of the one of the main theorems of um, our paper. Okay, so before I, I say what about the proofs, let me just give a few examples. So, um, if you so that, this is what I said before. So if you take C to be just the, the identity, which certainly works, uh, then what you get is basically a petition function where um, so let's see which one is which one is which. So. Um, 
I guess it doesn't really matter which one is which, but uh, with my usual convention, um, yeah, I guess one of them it has to be, so it's like the bracket of this thing where you have like some SN put somewhere. So the way you should think about it as the bracket is some kind of essential, morally it's like, maybe I'll put in an orange, like closing these things together, right? It's, oh, oops, wrong way. It's kind of like closing these things together in some sense. And, but here we're, we're not putting anything, which in some sense means the colors have to match. So you recognize this to be exactly uh, the petition. So this is exact, exactly the petition function uh, of the picture I shown at the very beginning. Um, so um, this story, right? So here the symmetrization means essentially it becomes uncolored. So it's just a free. And here the color must match. So that's the meaning of the one N basically. Um, now the other example I gave you is SN. So now you're symmetrizing both ways. So that means you're effectively killing both colors. So now you just have a petition function which only has sort of two colors. Uh, so they, you, can, you can forget about which colors. So they're all like, let's say red here and coming out red as well, right? And, and, and the other ones are unoccupied. So this is your favorite uh, is again, Kerepin petition function. Um, as I said, there are two more examples which are interesting, but um, maybe I'm not going to say so much about it. So, uh, yeah, not mention them. Okay, so no, in the last um, um, ten minutes, let me say a few words about the proof and the um, maybe some of the applications. So the, the proof of the main theorem is actually surprisingly um, tricky. Um, we don't know directly how to pr prove this, so we do it kind of like, you know, fairly roundabout way. So first, we start with a sort of new characterization of um, uh, a n, and um, so the idea is we're going to, we, you know, which is of course very similar to ideas we had with uh, Philippe Di Francesco years ago when we were playing with the very similar wheel conditions, but not, not the sort of toroidal wheel conditions, more like the usual ones. So slightly simpler wheel conditions, but so the idea is to characterize elements by specializations. So um, an element of a n, p of a n is entirely determined by certain specializations. Um, and this is where I need to, so I don't screw up, I have to read the paper. Uh, so just give me a sec. This is the part where I, if I improvise, I'll get it wrong. Um, here we go. Um, yes, so number one, uh, we're gonna take the, um, Um, so we have to be a little bit careful that, okay, yeah, let me just write it and then let me not comment on this because, so basically it's just setting variables to zero. Um, yeah, let me just write it this way. And the second one is just um, um, oh, okay. So you fix some R. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I should say that. Let R be uh, in one end. So there, there's some arbitrary choice of how far you, you're going to specialize before you give up and say, okay, this is it. I'm done, and um, I'll stop there. So uh, let's say T. You could use Q or T. Doesn't matter. Uh, R one X. Uh, x r plus one x n. So the idea is, you need okay, you need some kind of trivial, not trivial, but some some cases where you send the parameters to zero, and then um, the rest you you just form this kind of t wheel with the first uh, r variables, and then you you leave the other ones free basically. And the fact that it's enough to um, 
determinant, determinant element of an is basically just checking really carefully that you know because of the degree conditions on the on the variables there, there's you know that, that that's it's like degree kind of factor exhaustion type of reasoning. Okay. Um, so, and and then what we do is we. Um, so in principle, you could go. Yeah, you could. Yeah. So R can be any value to n, and in fact, you could just take R equals n, but it's not particularly um, enlightening. So yeah, in some sense, the, the theorem is strongest for R equals n, but uh, we don't need to go all the way usually. And um, and so then the, the proof is as follows: we consider. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna show that. Um, um, Well, we, we're going to look at the. Um, we're going to explicitly look look at the. Um, well, I, I guess I don't have the little diagram anymore. But where is the diagram? We're going to compare. Uh, yeah, it must have been somewhere. I must have drawn the. Hi, here we go. Right. So we're going to look at this diagram, and we're going to take a particular elements, and we're going to kind of follow them either through here or through here, basically. Uh, and the elements we choose are. Uh, product of uh, products of uh, elementary symmetric polynomials. So we need. So now we, what we're going to do is pick a basis of uh, yeah, pick a basis of uh, say lambda. So so linear basis. So um, um, so in our case is going to be uh, denote e lambda to be the product from i equals r one to r of e lambda i. So products of elementary symmetric polynomials and see what happens to them. Um, um, via the little diagram and see that, that they sort of agree. Um, so on the one hand, um, all right, I guess, yes, I haven't said that. So on the one hand, the, um, um, so our, yeah, I already mentioned the, uh, yeah, I should have, I guess I should have introduced the anti-symmetrizer. So here we really need antisymmetrizers, I guess, which I didn't introduce before. So if you define a n to be, or a, yeah, a n to be sum over w in s n of, so this is what I'm going to screw up as well. So I need to check this uh, minus t inverse on minus t. I never remember. Okay, it doesn't really matter. Let, let me I think it's minus t inverse to the power w times t w. And in the Exact same way that um, yeah, it's minus t inverse. That's correct. Yeah, um, and then what we, we're really going to compute is basically chi of. So we're going to consider this element. Oh yeah, and then a lambda to be product of. Um, well, sorry, tensor product. I guess that's a product of um, i equals one to r of a uh, lambda i. And then what we're going to compute is this thing. So that's one, uh, not very many problems with notation here. This is Sn is the symmetrizer uh, f. Uh, so that's one way of going through the, the diagram. And we are going to show, so that, the, so that this is the question, whether this is equal to basically uh, epsilon lambda, where uh, epsilon lambda is by definition again epsilon lambda one uh, star uh, star epsilon lambda r. And if this is true, then we've shown on the basis that the diagram commutes, therefore it commutes basically. And so, um, and we apply the lemma uh, to both sides basically. So both sides live in, uh, in a n. And uh, we have to show that the equal, therefore we show, have to show that all those specializations agree. So we have to compute things like. Um, um, specializing using variables to zero, so that's kind of trivial. But then, and yeah, so I don't know how much I want to say about that. Um, yeah, so basically, let me just say apply lemma to both sides because I realized that this is too long to explain in detail. Um, and and the way I compute, at least what I like to do, um, uh, the computation of the partition functions, and in particular the left hand side, there's some nice again diagrammatic calculus. So you can do it entirely using diagrams, basically. Um, because 
So now you have you have pictures like you know things like that, where you have like SN here, but then you have a bunch of little A's here, and you kind of move them around and do various things, and, and you can show that you can compute basically the specializations of the left hand side this way, and the right hand side is just by brute force computation basically. The epsilon lambda, the epsilons I wrote before are just very explicit products, so we know how to uh, compute there. Um, um, uh, they compute everything, compute the shuffle products and other specializations. Okay, so finally, the promised application, which is the computation of the um, of the, the full partition function in, in the trimetric case. So let me denote Kn to be the case. So this is the uh, f of uh, 1n, basically. So it's, it's this partition function I had, but now, of course, in general, this is the trigonometric one and also with arbitrary parameters. So like qx1, qxn. Uh, x1, xn, and then these boundary conditions. So an sn here, and then a, a bracket, something like that. And there's some there's some constants I'm, I'm uh, not uh, including. So the the final expression uh, is for, is the for, is the following proposition: Kn satisfies uh, the following recurrence relation. So all you have to do is just um, so it's a completely explicit recurrence relation. Um, K so it, but it's a bit weird. It's it's you wouldn't have, as I said, you wouldn't have guessed it uh, if I hadn't given it to you, or if, well, if, uh, sorry, yeah, so let me make sure I don't, I write correctly, so there's an xi, uh, that's a kn minus one, x hat i with the usual notation, x hat i means the, this one is missing, and then there's a product, and j equals one to n, j not equal to i, um, of our favorite, um, um, oh yeah, so I'm using here, um, okay, yeah, let me write it this way, I'll explain, I'm using slightly different notations here, um, xj over xi, that's the third one, one minus q1, q2, xi over xj, and that's the denominator, which is the usual kind of on the mundial -like denominator. And yeah, I've used different notations here. I've used t, I've rewritten t to be q1, q2 inverse, and the q to be q1 inverse, so you can just substitute. And that's it, I mean, and with some trivial um, initial condition. So you can literally just plug in uh, successively these things and you'll, you'll get your partition function, basically. Okay, I should probably stop here. I'm thinking I've run out of time, so thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was actually, this thought just came to my mind. So like, 